Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for braving the cold, um, for being here with us at the Jewish Museum tonight. My name is Jenna Weiss. I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs. And it's really my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's conversation with Pat Cleveland and Shoakot Kazarian. This event is held in conjunction with the exhibition Mood of the Moment, Gabby Aguillon and the House of Chloe, the first museum exhibition to honor visionary Jewish entrepreneur Gabby Aguillon and her legacy. We still have a few related programs planned in the new year, including a talk on Thursday, January 25th, where Kazarian joins Chloe archivist Geraldine Sommier and fashion writer Dal Shoda for a conversation about the role of the archive. For full details, please visit our website to sign up for our e-news. And before I introduce our speakers, I would like to thank the rest of the curatorial team on this exhibition, led by Claudia Gould with Leon Levy assistant curator Christina Parsons. The exhibition catalog and related publications are available in the shop downstairs after the talk. And now to briefly introduce our speakers, Pat Cleveland has been an international top model and trailblazer in the fashion industry for almost six decades. She has worked for prestigious fashion designers, including Armani, Halston, Valentino, and of course, Chloe, both on and off the runway. Through her illustrious modeling career, Cleveland has appeared on the pages of Ebony, Essence, Interview, W Magazine, and Vogue, and has been photographed by legendary photographers, including Richard Avedon, Helmut Newton, and Stephen Meisel. Recently, Cleveland received the Thurgood Marshall Award for being a fashion icon and earned a Fashion Achiever Award from FIT, a Lifetime Achievement Award by the UCOF, and a Fashion Innovator Award by Emerge. Cleveland regularly motivates and inspires during speaking engagements such as this at museums and institutions worldwide. In 2017, she published her autobiography, Walking with the Muses, a memoir. And Shoakot Kazarian is an Armenian-born French curator and art historian now based in New York City. She was formerly curator at the Musée d'Art Moderne in Paris and taught at the Ecole de Louvre. She curated exhibitions on artists such as Lucio Fontana, Piero Manzoni, Carol Apple, and Henry Darger with accompanying exhibition catalogs and has written extensively on post-war, contemporary, and outsider art. Now, if you can please take a moment to silence your cell phones and join me in welcoming Pat Cleveland and Shoakot Kazarian. Thank you everyone for being here and Pat, thank you. I can't believe I'm here in your presence uh, and I kind of hope that just being close to you I will kind of absorb your grace and your charisma. Um, it's so funny because I remember when the exhibition opened early October, I was um, speaking with a few people who know you to tell them how excited I was because it's not every day you get to talk with such a legend. But at the same time, I was stressed and how I'm going to get ready for this and be prepared. And everybody told me, oh, you'll see. This will be the easiest talk you'll ever do. Pat is so charismatic, smart, funny, and has so many amazing stories to tell. Um, well, that was true. I met you. And also, um, I read your amazing book that I highly recommend. Um, you tell these stories in such a candid voice, very sincere, and it's so impressive how many people you met and how many experiences uh, you've had across the Atlantic Ocean. And, but we're not here to talk about the book, and we can just spend the entire week speaking about your life uh, and all those amazing decades. Uh, but today I wanted to more concentrate on your years at Chloe to know more about it. And so I've just done a, just a little selection to refresh your memory of just a few pictures of you where you walked with Carl Lagerfeld at Chloe in the 70s. I love these images. Oh. This one is so beautiful. 
did some photo shoots. But you know, when I was looking through these images, oh my God, you're laughing with Carl and the parrot. You rarely see him laugh so much. I mean, he definitely loved you. And, but I was a bit, oh, you can see Pat here in the middle. And, but you know, when I looked through these images, I was a bit frustrated because, um, you know, this is not what I heard of you uh, about the way you walked the runway, it was so specific and I was frustrated. So I started looking into videos and here I got exactly what I was looking for. And so you have a, some, a few excerpts of you. I think this speaks better of you than stiff images. Uh, so my first question to you will be to get back to where it started. So why around 1970, I think, you decided to move to Paris from New York where you already had a career and how you met Carl and started collaborating with him at Chloe? Oh boy, <laughs> what a romance. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's just something about how do people meet each other. First, I had met Antonio Lopez up at uh, the Green Room at Vogue, and he was sort of replacing uh, another artist called Manning Obergon, who worked with Dinah Vreeland. And at that time, I was in school, teenager, in art school, art and design here in New York, and um, I met Antonio. And Antonio wanted to go to Paris to work, and. At that point in my career, I had done everything and gone as far as I could in America with my career. There were very few magazines here as there were in Europe. So my friend Antonio said, when you come to Europe, you come stay with me. So I went to Europe and I went to Paris. After Italy, I went to Italy first, but there were so many playboys. I said, I have got to get out of here because all they wanted to do was party. And I'm a very serious person. I really just want to work, you know. I want to be with the artists and make a difference and be present and see things being created. So I said, I'm out. I'm going to Paris right away. I landed in Paris, and the little Citron car came to pick me up with Antonio's assistant, Juan, who was very intelligent. He knew everything about fashion history, but... Let me go back a step because Antonio Lopez, when he was 16 years old, he did all these illustrations for the New York Times. And when I was in art school, I used to copy his drawings. <laughs> Little did I know I'd meet the man. <laughs> so I met him and his entourage of very beautiful boys and girls. And one of those girls was a friend of mine. Her name was Donna Jordan. And we went to the same art school, but she studied stage and I studied illustration and fashion design. So Donna Jordan made her way to Paris, and she was, before she went to Paris, she said, would you come down to Arthur's Club with me, and I want you to meet these artists. Well, I went down to the club, but it was late at night. I had to get home. And in the corner sat this guy with curly raven black hair, and another one with very white hair. Little did I know that these people would change my life. I said, Donna, I have to go home. I have school tomorrow. But she was a party girl. So I left her there, and I went home. 
come to find out that that man sitting in the corner was Antonio Lopez, and the one sitting with him was Andy Warhol. Little did I know that they would become part of my life. So I get to Paris, and my friend Donna is already there making a movie called L'Amour. L'Amour, this film. And she wanted to be a movie star. Who didn't want to be a movie star when you were a kid? You went to movies. You watched the old 1920s and 30s movies and all Greta Garbo and all these movie stars in black and white photographed by Horst, the photographer. Everything was cigarettes and Betty Davis and Joan Crawford and all of these wonderful musicals. Other than that, that was our soul. That's what we were living for. We were living to be in a musical. We were living to be alive. And we had to go to the City of Lights, Paris, where all the artists lived. And we studied art, of course. We wanted to go there. So there we go. I arrive in Paris, and little did I know that Donna was there, and Donna was there, and Antonio was there, and they were living on Rue Bonaparte. Rue Bonaparte is in Saint-Germain. Saint-Germain is where all the expats used to go. All the really in intellectual artists would be there sitting at the cafe floor. So there we were, staying in this tiny apartment that was just near the School of the Beaux-Arts, right on the corner there, on the Rue Bonaparte. So we go into this apartment, and I see Antonio. And it's a beautiful little apartment, all art deco, very, very, very tiny, with no kitchen, because nobody cooked. <laughs> they only ate makeup and wore clothes. <laughs> and I was used to an American a breakfast, which I didn't get. <laughs> so that I arrived and said, let's go to the corner. Well, whose place are we staying at? Oh, this is our friend Carl. And who is Carl? Who is Carl? Well, this mysterious person was the man who was hosting us. But, I mean, it was a really tiny apartment. So in this place where we stayed, in Carl's apartment, on Rue Bonaparte, was Donna, Corey, Antonio, Juan, and me. Five people staying in one room. Now, can you imagine? We were just artists, young teenagers from America. So we were kind of sleeping toe to nose in sleeping bags on the floor. <laughs> and it was hysterical because all we wanted to do was dress up. And did I, I had no idea how we were going to go forward. So we would be there all day sketching, but who's, what are we sketching for? Who's, who are these sketches for? For our friend Carl. Carl, who is this person? Oh, you'll meet him one day. So a week goes by and we go out flirting, we go to the La Fleur, and then finally the night comes. Oh, Carl wants us to come over to see him. Oh, he does. Oh, okay. So the boys, they dressed in these beautiful Chloe. I had no idea what any of this was. But they had these silk shirts with these Tiffany prints and very colorful. And the boys, they had one shirt on top of the other. They would wear one shirt on top of the other to stay warm because it's Paris and they didn't have central heating. But the silk was very warm. And, and suddenly, I was dressing in these clothes. And I had these beautiful shawls with Tiffany uh, lamps and all kinds of crazy toy prints and colors with tassels. And we'd put them on and go out. OK, tonight we're going to Carl's apartment. What? Who? What? OK, let's go. Everybody going to Carl's on Rue de la Universita was where he lived. And he lived in this beautiful sort of there was a French iron gate that you walked through. And when you walked there, there was like this little, little uh, garden that you had to go into. And there was a Rolls Royce park there. Well, that was pretty hot for me. I'd never seen a Rolls Royce parked in a garden in France. And you go past the garden and the Rolls Royce, and you go up these beautiful marble stairs to the second floor where his apartment was. Well, little did I know anything about Carl. And he said, well, Carl this, Carl that. Oh, he's so smart. So we walk into the apartment, and I am just flabbergasted. I see things out of a 1930s movie. Everything is in black and white, and the lighting is like in one of those beautiful movies where everything is the cat, the lily, perfectly lit in a jar, a beautiful vase from the 1930s, and beveled glass mirrors on the walls, and black onyx floor 
and chandeliers, and I'm just in awe, because who welcomed us at the front door? A maid dressed in a beautiful French maid's costume. <laughs> and this is something I had never seen before in my life. I mean, I'm just a regular person out of art school going to Paris. So there we go. She invites us in, walk over the black mar onyx floor, standing under the chandelier, looking around in awe. And then suddenly someone, something, boo, comes up behind me. And I think, oh, who is this? And it was Carl. Aha, he says, ha ha, that's how I met Carl the first time. He scared the daylights out of me. He came up from behind and, and tickled me in the back like, ha ha, I got you. And he said, ha ha, I got you, I got you. You didn't know I was coming into the room, ha ha. He loved to play, play cranks and jokes on you and things like that. Okay, we're going out to dinner. And the boys look so beautiful. They all dress with a little bow tie and three-piece suits. I mean, in Paris, you really do dress up. And the boys were so elegant in their silk shirts and their buttons. And Carl was standing there. And I looked at him, and he had the same curly hair as Antonio. They had this black raven curly hair. And he says, no, my dear, he had on his, his smoking coat which is something you wear when you're really like living in a castle or something. And he had this velvet smoking coat, uh, three quarters length on. He says, well, I have to get dressed and we have to get dressed. But that Marlena, she makes me so angry because tonight we were supposed to have dinner with her and she came and she, she told me we were late. So we came back. So we're going to have dinner together, my dear. And you're going to wear this. I was going to give it to her tonight. She wanted it, but she's not going to get it now. And I said, what? And he was going to give me something, and I just met him. And so, go, go change. And he suddenly threw this blue, electric blue chiffon, pleated, multi-pleated, lightweight lingerie at me. He says, here, wear this. And so I said, oh, OK. So I went and I changed. And before you knew it, I was wearing Marlene Dietrich's lingerie. <laughs> and I had nothing on but my little G-string underneath. And I was standing there in this pillar of the way he had made it. It was a pillar of um, just very pleats, pillared. And it was pillared when I was standing still. But if you move and you put your arms up, it's very transparent. So <laughs> we decided to go to dinner at La Coupole, which is a famous place where all the fashion people went because in the evenings, they like to show off, you know, show off in little tribes of this one and that one and little designer groups of friends and ta-ta, la-di-da. So anyway, we walk into La Capole, and I have this pillar dress on that I feel completely secure in because I'm covered, you know, it's a lingerie and chiffon, I'm covered. And the boys are dressed in their tuxedo coming in because it is fashion week. After all, you have to dress like that. And I get, I, I start walking in with the boys, with Carl and Antonio and the boys. The boys, you know how boys, beautiful boys are. And it's just boys and me. <laughs> because Donna went off to Rome to be in love with somebody. So anyway, <laughs> it was just me and the boys. Which was really fabulous, because I love boys, especially beautiful ones. <laughs> so <laughs> we're walking into Capole, showing off. And suddenly I feel something catch the back of this lingerie, which is like, has a train in the back of it, a train, very long train. And I feel, I'm, I'm walking forward, and I, I put my arms up like this, and before you know it, the dress is falling off of me in the back of me, and I have nothing on. And I'm in La Capole, half nude, and then suddenly I hear all of these people applauding, bravo, bravo, and they're like applauding. And, the, and it's like the whole, the whole restaurant stood up and started applauding when we walked in because of this lingerie that Carl put me in. And I, it was my birthday. It was my 21st birthday. So it was my dream come true. Carl made my dream come true, not about the nude part, but about the part that I was in Paris drinking champagne for the first time on my 21st birthday with Carl Lagerfeld. And he made that all possible uh, for me to be there because he was a generous soul. And we lived there, and we worked there, and there's much more to the story. Wow, 
Wow. That's the meeting. Oh my God, because when I was looking at this picture, it was so sexy, so glamorous, and you had that amazing complicity. But hearing your story of La Boheme in Paris, it makes it even more exciting. So we'll go to the next episode of your dream life in Paris. So have you heard of Chloe and, and, and what did you know of Chloe? How did you start working with Carl at Chloe? Well, first of all, there was a very tiny atelier that he had. And it was in one of those dusty old Parisian buildings. We have to go up the winding staircase and pass the dusty hallways or try to get up on the elevator. You know, the elevators And stay so clean, not to I, be covered in dust. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it was like, oh my God, where are we going? Creaky stairs covered with old rug and just sort of like, it was like maybe the first atelier because it was tiny, it was tiny, and bolts of fabric were everywhere, and it was tiny, and we were cozy in there, and Antonio and Carl would spend the day sketching with these new markers. It was a new thing that had come out, is these colored markers, and they were so happy with their colored markers, it was like kindergarten in there with Crayolas, but they used markers, and then they'd have these drawing contests, because Carl always said, well, I can't draw. But in the meantime, he was always making cartoons of Antonio drawing. And Antonio would be making these very serious drawings and, then would and very passionate about everything he was doing. And Carl would go, OK, let me draw something. And he would take like a, uh, one of those pieces of paper that you would put in a typewriter, regular 9 by 12 paper. And he'd take out the markers and say, well, today, my dear, you're going to be uh, Josephine. You're going to be Josephine. Marie Antoinette. Yes, let's make you into Marie Antoinette. And so he'd come over and say, that's a Carl's fantasy, typically. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's his period, 1700s, you know, like, oh, you're going to put, I'm going to put the white wig on you and everything. So he'd come over and say, but wait a minute, there's something missing on your face. So he'd take that magic marker, which was his favorite thing, and he'd come over and say, let me just give you a mole. And he'd come with the magic marker, put a big mole on my face with those magic markers that doesn't come off. So I'd have that mole on for like the rest of the week or something. And so he was very uh, intuitive about what people needed to have as much as being fun. He was never serious. Everything was a cartoon for him. And I was one of his cartoon characters. And he would draw me as everything. He drew me as Chanel. When he put the Chanel clothes in, Marie Antoinette, and this one, and that one, and just. I was his, I was his, I don't know, I guess his model. I was his <laughs> model. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but how did you move from these parties in Parisian cafes and studios to the Chloe runway? How did it start? It? And how was he? How was he directing you? And, and how was this collaboration on the runway? Well, what happened was that finally, you know, I understood who he was working for. And occasionally, this lady that had a very smiley face and black hair and very casual looking and very relaxed and happy would come over to the atelier. She said, Carl, Carl, what are you do doing? Are you working or are you playing? He says, oh, we're just playing. She said, that's good. That's all I need to hear. <laughs> she says, I'm going down to the south of France. And so we're going to go down there and we're going to work. And so this is where I became close to Abby, going to the south of France. And this is how I became close, closer to Carl because I was invited down uh, to the south of France, to Saint-Tropez, to stay in his house. And he, he had two houses. He had one on the, uh, on the, uh, near the boats there. And that was, Abby had a house there too, with her son Philip. I remember her son Philip would come to the house and Abby would come to the house, and we'd have these work sessions, but it was a vacation as well. And I just remember Philip was like, what, 13 years old when I met him, Abby's son. And I remember Carl would always be like, well, why don't you two pose together or do something, you know? And he was so shy, and he would sort of disappear, and so I'd end up doing all so the So you posing. worked during holidays with Gabby and, and Carl yeah. in the house. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gabby was like really fun. She was always hugging me, and oh, I'm so happy you're here, but she was like really a mummy, a mummy to me. 
you know, because she would hug me like a mama and like, I'm so glad you're here. Make sure you eat today and, you know, and all, making sure I was happy with, and eating. And she was very generous like that. And so it, it came that we had to do our first show for Chloe. And uh, at that time, it was sort of like just beginning doing shows for the, ati for the um, houses of the designers. And everyone had their, you would go, it was very serious, you know? I think it was very serious because I had worked for Madame Gray and I had worked for some other designers like Cardano and everything. But this show for Chloe was given in a restaurant in the, near the, oh. near the Arc de Triomphe, there's two restaurants down at the bottom. You know that one that's white marble? I didn't know the name of it. But anyway, um, so it was that day, and Carl had been out making this movie with Andy and Donna. And when Donna Jordan arrived, and Andy Warhol arrived, and, and, and then I was there, it was like pop art became the thing. And so Donna was very, uh, popular because she was with Andy Warhol and Carl loved Andy Warhol because he loved Antonio. So it was like Carl, Antonio, Andy Warhol, me, Donna, and a few others. We were like a little gang. So the first show was amazing for me because it was my coming out in Paris and I came out in Chloe. That was my first show. Oh, wow. So Chloe. It's very significant. First show because I was working in the uh, cabine of the other designers, but my first show was Chloe in Paris. So we came this winding staircase coming down into the audience, a creme de la creme like all you people, <laughs> and um, arriving in Paris and everyone really enjoying the show. And there was so much, there was so much clothing, there was so much to show. And in those days they were like, so few models. There were like 10 of us doing like 100 garments, like 20, 30 each. So the shows would go on for like two hours, just coming down and showing off. And, and then finally, it was like, you know, the Chloe shows kept going and going. And over the years, the, the platform became more of a stage instead of a restaurant. So I came in in that period before it became the runways. I came in in that period when it was more private and it was more in the cafe and it was more, uh, it, was, it was just a kind of like private art world. And uh, Chloe was a big brand and Carl was very happy working with Abby because it was like a little family. And, and speaking of the runway, as we saw in this small mm -hmm. videos, yeah. It seems like so natural to you to be on the runway, to move, mm -hmm. and as, as a model, you're very recognized for your walking style <laughs> to make everything so much fun and performative. <laughs> and how, how did it come to you? Was it Carl who directed you? Was it you? How, how did it happen that you performed? You were so alive, which, which is very much in tune with Gabby's idea of what Chloe should be, something that you move in, that's something that brings happiness. So it seems like you were the perfect personality for Chloe. And how, how all this happened? Well, I think nightlife has a lot to do with it. Oh, <laughs> OK. You know, we actually wore those clothes out in the evening. I mean, that was our life. Our clothing was what got us out at night. We, we wore those clothes to live in them. And they were very easy to wear. They were lightweight and you could dance in them. And you know, it wasn't heavy. It was like, you can go, you could stay all, all night and not have to walk the walk of shame the next day. <laughs> because your clothes could be day or night, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, that silk really helps <laughs> you to get through the streets during the day. And in the summertime, it's so lovely. I mean, I went over the first time in the summer in the nightlife in Paris. You know, it just reflects a breeze of, of, of fantasy. You know, being a girl in Paris and wearing high heels and being with all of these gorgeous boys that knew how to dance. And so the dancing of the evening went on to the runway. It was just like a continuous flow of living your life in this beautiful entourage of fashion people and just enjoying. I mean, 
we kept it kind of tight there, though. We were just our little group, you know, and we came, f most of us were from America, and I think the wonderful thing was the combination of Carl and Abby and the cultures mixing, which made it so exciting because the Americans, which was Donna Me and Antonio, we brought in that Latin music and that, you know, that Puerto Rican salsa, and we brought in that, you know, R&B and James Brown, and we brought all of that music with us. So that translated onto the runway. You know, our lives translated onto the runway. Our des designs that he made translated onto what was happening in the evening. It became the day on the runway. And so it was just a, it was a melange of, you know, these different cultures of America mixed with France and Carl with his, you know, integrity. I mean, he was so, he worked all the time. He was always making things, making Antonio. Everybody was working. I was working. We were there, you know, we had a lot of integrity in our work. It was about the work. We, we were living for it. We couldn't breathe without a new dress. <laughs> you know? I still can't believe how you were making it because both like you, Antonio and Carl, you were working all the time, partying all the time. I, I don't know, your days were not 24 hours. No. It was just, I don't know how you did it, but was it was no time. more than 24 hours. I don't know how you managed to do that, but. Uh, Coke Monsieur and crepes. <laughs> Caviar and champagne. It is, it, you can stay alive with that, you know. <laughs> I mean, Could during you? the day, it was the Coke Monsieur. Until Carl would take us out to have the uh, filet mignon uh, poivre and uh, the escargot, which, by the way, I didn't know what to use to eat it. And I would be sitting next to Carl, and the escargot thing would be like flipping around, and I would, uh, <laughs> snails. Anyway. <laughs> And what would you like to eat? Would you like some escargot? Okay, <laughs> I'll have it. But anyway, so dining out with Carl was a very big deal because sometimes he would gift us with antique clothing. Like I remember he gave me a Scaparelli beaded jacket. But he also gave another girl a Scaparelli beaded jacket. And she got so angry with me when she saw me walking with that jacket. And Carl was always creating these little havocs between us all by giving the other girl the other dress to see what would happen. There's a whole bunch of that going on in fashion, you know. You don't want the other lady to have the same dress. <laughs> I mean, that's how it was then. I didn't know how it is now, but that's how it was then. <laughs> yeah. um, I wanted to ask you a little bit if when you worked on the runways, you had a, a chance to understand a little bit the dynamic within the house of Chloe between Carl, Gabby, Gabby's uh, business associate, Jacques Lenoir, and... Ja Jacques. Jacques Lenoir, okay. the business associate, yes. or yeah. did you see Carl and Gabby working together, or...? Well, you know, I'm, I think the business part is not my business. <laughs> Good I'm point. more on the party part and the creative you know, I'm runway. there with the designer when he's like, oh, aha, I know what you mean. Oh. So I'm more like in the aha moment. But business is business, and things do rev up, and things get bigger. You know, it's like it just grows like a virus. You know, it's like it's growing all the time. And we're just there trying to keep it alive, you know? I think keeping a company alive is the most difficult thing. You have to feed it constantly. So there we were, working all the time, you know? Like, it would be a 24-hour day work experience sometimes. You know, getting, with Antonio getting those sketches out, and Carl, he didn't mind, actually, because he was a really good napper, by the way. <laughs> I mean, that's the secret right there. You know, you have to be like a cat. We were all like a cat. So we know, I mean, I could fall asleep right now, you know? Because <laughs> that's how I do it. That's how I go Lucky 24 you. hours. No, that's how you do it, actually. <laughs> you know. It's interesting that you said that you, you like to be there in, during the aha moment because you called your book Walking with the Muses. And we always think, oh, you are the muse, but you also see other people as your muses. Yeah. And because you've known so many muses and extraordinary people, I wanted to ask you, 
if you've seen big changes uh, in the industry over time and, and if there's something that you would like to discuss about the changes, good or bad, that you've seen? Well, you know, I always try to see the good in everything because, you know, you make a choice. What do you want to see, you know, the way the world is or the way you want it heaven or hell? <laughs> So I choose the sparkly and the bright, and I know everything else exists. But you know, for fashion, um, the creative people want to keep churning out the beauty. The, the people who are creative just want to make the world beautiful. But with business and politics and the way the world turns around and during those times, it's all about who is chosen to what amount of money is going to be made, which is not my business at all. But you know, I see that it's more popular fashion in the more general sense and people are more interested now than ever before. I believe that there was a time when people were not as interested and they loved it, but it's more touchable now, I think, for more people to get more things that are more interesting. Whereas, you know, before when I grew up, I had to make my clothes because they were so expensive. You know, we. <clears throat> I used to work for uh, Vogue Patterns in Simplicity, you know, uh, modeling for the patterns that you could buy. You know, I learned to sew and make my own clothes because I just remember a time when you couldn't get couture or anywhere near ready to wear nice clothes. You know, you could get like a, a house dress, you can make a house dress or you can invent something. But I see that things change now where more people are more interested in making clothes, like young designers. I see there are more young designers now, and there are more designers than there were before. Many, many more designers. And that's the change I see, because when I started modeling in 1966, you know, the masters of design were very few, you know? And when I, I knew, it, before Saint Laurent, Givenchy even, you know, I was modeling very young, and um, you know, I was like 15, and I just remember hearing these names. But some of them were not even that, you know, grounded in who they would be as a legend. And I just see the difference now that there's more people interested. You know, there's TikTok and Instagram and YouTube, and more people are coming out. You know, from underground quickly quickly, but it's a turnover like that. Here one day, gone tomorrow. It's like, you know, quick fashion. And that's kind of what I see that's different. Quick fashion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's different. Before we move uh, to the Q&A, I have one last question that okay. is more personal, if I may. I know my husband who is in the audience, he will dislike my question. He will say I'm rude, but I'm still going to ask you this. <laughs> I always ask this question to artists. and. Um, so it's about age, yes. about time, uh -huh. about also looking back, uh -huh. which is not always easy. I know so many people don't like to speak about the past, yeah. don't like the idea of aging, but although you seem to be someone who's so at ease with all that, so maybe if there's something you would like to talk about, the idea of age looking uh -huh. backwards or also looking to the future and what does it mean now that you have you wrote a memoir, so you ask yourself those questions? And well, you know, if you're looking back, you're looking forward too, because there's stepping stones of greatness in your past or failure in your past. So thank God you have a past, and as you go forward, you try to see how far you can go. You know, you're supposed to live to 120. But I don't know, with all the wars and everything, I'm just glad to be alive with all these things we had to go through. And so I'm not a victim of my age. I'm, I'm proud of my age. I'm proud to have had experience. And I always think of myself as a sequoia, you know? So get rooted, go down, go down. Yes, they say you shrink as you get older, so you're going down into your roots, you know? So get rooted in yourself and grow, into, grow down into your roots. Don't try to like blossom every 10 minutes. Not even a rose does that, you know? Get thorny and just whatever that other rhymes with. But anyway, I'm sorry, this is English, right? Okay, so, <laughs> oh la la, chérie l'amour toujours, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. But, um, you know, just keep your enthusiasm uh, rooted in who you truly are, and uh, that should be a sparkle, uh, a little, little sparkle, I think we come from the sun or something, you know? 
No, it's, it's really huge. It's very big. The universe is very big. So just be a part of it. Don't worry. Don't worry about it, you know? Don't waste your time. That's what I say. Uh, what? You said, you said, you said what? You said but. I said, don't show me your buts. Show me your yeses. And if you say no to me, I say, oh, you said no? Okay, you're on. What is no is N-O and on is O-N. I'm on, honey. <laughs> so stay on. Flip that switch. That's what I say about life. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. I told you it will be easy. <laughs> well, thank you so much because uh, it's so beautiful. Uh, for me, it was such a lesson to hear you, to read your book, how comfortable you are with your present, your past. You're one of these few models who, who have been active since, I mean, since your teenage years and until today. And you're amazing in different ways in everything you do. So, well, thank you. It's, it's a good lesson, I think, for all of us. I'm sure you have questions to ask uh, to Pat. Um, so yeah, we're going to come around with a microphone, so I'll try and get to you. Sorry, Miss Cleveland. Oh, boy. Oh, run. No, what? Miss Cleveland, I enjoyed the book a lot. But what I enjoyed most is how delicately you handled the UK, uh, Hugh Bell story. It was just, I mean, you, you, I fell in love with you because. Do you oh. know Hugh Bell? Oh, of course, yeah. And you were just... How do you know Hugh Bell? How do I know him? Yes. Oh, no, no, I'm not. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I know him because he was a beautiful cat. Oh, he was lovely. Uh, it, I was it, so fortunate to... You know, when I was testing... Uh, testing means going out and having your photograph taken by photographers who like to try out the lighting. Mm. I mean, they didn't have the telephones then, right? Those little... where we take our pictures. but. Really, the profession that they chose is so magical because they could take a picture and go in a dark room and make an image appear. And I, I remember Hugh Bell and his studio. And at the time, um, a photograph was a cherished, a very cherished thing. And um, they would make prints, like we're huge prints. He would make huge prints of me, like you know, a uh, painting size. That was sort of the thing at that time. And they would make these huge prints. And well, anyway, I had this por portfolio, which is where you carry your photographs with these huge prints, and he made most of them. He made most of them. So he helped me to look good in the photo so I could get the job. And I really loved him. Thank you for asking about him. It was beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I read, like, I, I know Yeah, a jazz. You know, like I just remember, you know, um, many of the photographers in that time were in another world, in the jazz world, mm -hmm. you know? And now these days it seems that music and fashion are like the musicians are becoming designers and the designers are becoming musicians. So I sing, by the way. So uh, go on Spotify and you'll hear tonight Josephine. And I have a new cartoon called The Girl from 7th Avenue, which is, I'm a cartoon character. So you can probably see that on YouTube. Enough about me. Anyway, I love, it, it, it's all about working with other people. So my, what I do is I work with artists, you know, and I try to help them realize what they want to realize. Whether it's I'm wearing their dress or speaking their words or singing their songs. It's so that they can come out and we can have fun together presenting their project. So thank you, Hugh Bell. Thank you, Hugh Bell. Thanks for the question. Hmm? Yeah. Hi, Pat. Thank you for taking time to come and talk to us all tonight. Um, I could just listen to you talk for hours. <laughs> um, I'm a young designer myself, kind of just starting out, trying to work in the industry. Any advice you have for people trying to make a long career? You need to enjoy the moment and, and buddy up. You need a buddy system, because you can't do it by yourself. So, so find some other people who love what you love and stay in your little group and inspire each other to go keep going. That's what it's all about. You need more than one wing to fly, you know what I mean? And be the peacock you were born to be. I mean, did you ever see the back of a peacock? Look at them. 
they are full of structure. So structure, have strategy, and get some friends to help you. Because that's the only way it's going to work. You're welcome. Maybe one last question? Great. Oh, okay, two. You were very young when you first started. Did you have the support of your family as you came abroad and traveled and, and you know, uh, knew all these early designers and such? Well, I think it's important to be supported by someone. And I had my mother, who is an artist. Her name is Ladybird. And uh, she always believed that there's something that I could do. And when it came to the time when I, I was designing and painting and doing but then I saw that there was a different opportunity given to me. She supported me. And when I went on the Ebony Fashion Fair, which was my first job in America, uh, she went along as my chaperone. And later in life, uh, when I lived in Italy, I owned a model agency for 20 years in Milan. And when the girls came over, if they came over and they were 13 years old without a chaperone or a mother, I would send them back to Russia or Africa, wherever they came from, because um, I think you do need a chaperone at an early age. You know, not everybody is on the side of the light. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Miss Cleveland. What a pleasure and honor to be in your presence. I love your book. It brought me so much joy to read it and your stories of sleeping in Washington Square Park and so many amazing, you know, adventures that you had. Um, and I feel like I see you everywhere in documentaries and most recently in the, um, the documentary about Doniele uh, Luna, the first um, black supermodel. And what a um, poignant and sad story. And yet I'm so glad her story is out there. But I, I wanted to just touch on, like, I think something that we all respond to is your joy and your positivity. And I know it could not have been easy to be a pioneer and a woman of color in fashion, you know, at the time that you did. And I was wondering um, what has kept you afloat, you know, through the dark times and always positive through everything? I think we all have a purpose in this life and sometimes you find out what it is in your young life um, I think it has a lot to do with how I was raised um, my mother um, had a very difficult time she grew up in Georgia and there was a lot of racism and I had experienced much of that in my life as well uh, traveling through America and having very difficult situations life and death horror um, when you see the things that you don't want, you, you try to imagine what you could have. And when something is given to you, you do your very best to make it the best. You give 100, more than 101% of yourself to something. And you just, you sort of build up a, it's sort of like you build a, a shield around yourself because you know that you've had a really hard time. So nothing could be worse than what that was. And in America, uh, there was a lot of very bad things that I had to get away from. And um, it gave me courage because I knew I had to keep going forward. And I think people, you know, in the world, when they have a hellish, hell, hellish situation, should, if any glimmer of light, which is what fashion is, it's a glimmer, uh, any kind of, Thing that can take you through your life and make you feel safe, uh, you should try to adhere to it. Um, for some people, it's many different things, science or nursing. Some people want to be doctors. I couldn't be any of those things. So I just stuck to what was good for myself. And I realized that going forward, even now, there's things I'm still trying to achieve with my writing and my performing that Maybe if, this, if I do it well, then somebody else can think they can do it well too. You know, it's just sort of like um, you have a processes to go through to achieve things. And you should always go through the process and live in it and then have the experience of it and then tell somebody else how to get through it. 
So that's what I'm working on now. <laughs> yeah. Is that good? Is that all right? Okay. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was very moving and inspiring. And if you're interested to know more about Pat, I highly encourage you to read her amazing book that tells all her beautiful stories. Thank you so much. Thank you.